Like with the majors, it's well worth getting all the minor chords to the point where you can play them without thinking and see all the three notes of the triad as one shape. It helps you chunk information and learn songs quicker, read chords easier, memorize music, play chords in different ways. Again, in this video, we're just gonna concentrate on the chords in their original form called root position, which is just one of each note in order. That's the first thing you need to get down. I've got a worksheet available too, linked in the description, which has got a list of all the major and minor chords, plus all the practice and memory tips too. And I might also do a practice play along video to test how fast you can find these chords. So if that's something you think might be useful, please let me know in the comments by typing play along. For the chords that start on black notes, we're gonna learn them both ways, the flat version and the sharp version. Sometimes one is more common than the other, and we're also gonna end up in situations calling a white note a flat or a sharp and using things like double flats. Now I'm gonna put all the correct spellings in so you have them, but at this stage of learning, I really want you to just focus on finding the start note and then being able to see the shape easily. Don't get too hung up on the spellings at this stage. You can learn all that stuff properly another time. It's basically far more beneficial to focus on one aspect at a time. I've also got a more theory based video which is really important to learn too and that's linked down in the description below. So we'll start with C minor and I did mention this in the major video but I'll very quickly mention it again. That's the basic technique of playing some chords. First you want to make sure that your arm is right over the top of the keys making sure that you're feeling like you're holding your arm weight up properly and then when you push the keys down it's really about dropping your weight so that your fingers all go down cleanly at the same time. Make sure that your fingers do feel nice and relaxed though so that they can mold into the shape nice and comfortably, but then a slightly bit firm so they don't just buckle when you push down. Another really important thing is that you hold your hand far enough forward so that you can keep your wrist nice and straight and that your fingers aren't going at any strange angle so you can reach every note. That's gonna cause some wrist problems and some tension. So for fingers, there's not one set way to do this. There's two ways that I think are most useful for beginners to start doing, and that is finger one, finger two, and then finger four, or finger one, finger three, and finger five. A lot of beginners I've seen instinctively do one, two, three, because it's just a little bit easier to get to grips with, and sometimes you will need that, and they also sometimes do two, three, five but those first two i mentioned are sometimes harder for beginners to get and you're going to need them quite a lot so are going to be most useful for beginners to practice with your left hand again i think the most useful finger positions for beginners to get used to is one two four and one three five so the notes of this chord are c e flat and g and we're calling that e flat not D sharp because of the thirds rule. We want the notes in the chord to be three letters away from each other and C, D, E goes over the space of three letters. And then so does E, F, G. So with these kind of shaped chords, make sure that you're not playing the black note right on the edge. You come far enough forward to get a good grip. The next chord is C sharp minor. So we have C sharp, E and G sharp. If the first note of a minor chord is sharp, any other black notes are also going to be the sharp version. And the same with flats, we don't mix flats and sharps in this case. So with D shapes, you want to come far forward enough so you're not trying to pull your fingers up like that or anything. And you want to make sure that you come straight down on top of the chord, not at any weird angles trying to build it like this. See all the notes before you push it down. The other way of spelling this chord would be a D flat minor. We'd have to call this E an F flat in this case because of the rule I just mentioned. D, E, F goes over the space of three letters. It makes everything nice and neat and it looks better when you write things out in music as well. And it's because they're what's called a third. If that doesn't make sense, check out my theory video that I've mentioned. And then this top note would be A flat in this case. So D minor is all white notes. D, F and A. The next one, E flat minor, E flat, G flat, and B flat. And the alternate spelling would be D sharp, F sharp, and A sharp. Again, make sure your hand is far enough forward that you can reach all the notes comfortably, not too close to the edge of the black notes. E minor is all Y notes again, E, G, and B. F minor, F, A flat, and C. This is A flat, not G sharp, because F to A goes over the space of three letters. And it's the same shape as the C minor was. Again, keep your hand far enough forward that you're not right on the edge of the black note. 
Then we have F sharp minor, F sharp, A, and C sharp. And the alternate spelling for this one, you're not gonna come across this as much, but it's G flat. And then this note here would have to be called B double flat. Because it's a third, we want to use the spacing of three letters and G to B goes over the space of three letters. So if we look at a B, flatten it once by going down a half step, flatten it twice, hence double flat, you end up on an A, but in this case you'd call it a B double flat if you're spelling it correctly. And then the next note would be a D flat. This spelling isn't going to come up as much and again I just want you to really focus on just being able to find the shape and being able to play it comfortably more than the spelling. This is the same kind of shape technically to play as the C sharp minor was. G minor is G, B flat, D. Again it's B flat because of the rule, G to B is three letters. Then G sharp minor, G sharp, B and D sharp or the alternate spelling would be A flat. In this case, we'd have to call this note C flat because even though it's a white note, it is a semitone or a half step below C. So you, it can also be called C flat sometimes. And then this note is E flat. And that is also the same shape as the F sharp and the C sharp was. A minor, which is A, C and E, another white note one. Then we have B flat minor, B flat, D flat, and F. With this one, don't be tempted to put your wrist at this funny angle just because it makes that line. You still want to be straight so you come forward enough to keep straight. And the alternate spelling would be A sharp, C sharp, and in this case, you would call the F an E sharp to follow the rule that I've been talking about. That note is a half step above E, so in some cases it can make sense to call it E sharp. But once more, worry about the shape, being able to find it rather than the correct spelling. If you casually call that F instead of E sharp by accident or it helps you find it quicker visually, it's really not a big deal. It can become important when you're writing things out, but don't worry about it at sec. And then we have B minor. B, D and F sharp. So with this shape, make sure that you're not at this angle, just because it makes that angle come far enough forward so you can keep a straight wrist. So here's a couple of tricks to finding, practicing and memorizing these more easily. Even after memorizing the chords as a whole shape, if you forget sometimes, you should also know how to figure it out again. I like to use the outside two notes as a shell for seeing the chords. We did this for majors and the great thing is it works just as well for both. The distance or spacing between the notes, known as an interval, is called a fifth. Like the outside of C minor, for example. It goes over the space of five letters, and if you're not sure what that means, after this, watch the How to Build Major and Minor Chords Theory video in the description, which explains everything. But basically, it's five letters away. C, D, E, F, G. All of these chords, when they're in root position, have a fifth as the outside two notes. And apart from two exceptions, they're always matching colors, either both black or both white. And they always look and feel like the same kind of distance. And the two exceptions are B flat to F and B to F sharp, where the colors are opposite. They all kind of look and feel like the same distance apart on the keyboard. And taking a practical approach, which we are, you wanna just try and get used to the feel of this distance so that the next one up, a sixth, would just feel too big and the next one down, a fourth, would just feel too small. Because of the size of the gap, I think this is easier than counting how many half steps away it is. Once you have that fifth, you can find the middle note, the third, by jumping up one and a half whole steps, which is the same thing as three half steps. So one, two, three. That gives you the C minor shape. If we did that from E, there's the shell. One, two, three half steps, or one and a half whole steps. We did it from the A flat. There's the shell. One, two, three half steps, or one and a half whole steps. You can also practice those minor thirds on their own first if you need by picking any note and finding the next note, one and a half whole steps. One and a half from here. 
one and a half. Try that from all 12 notes. As it is important to eventually see these chords as just one block, this method teaches you how to find it again, but also I think it makes it easier to get that block memory down because it forces you into this wider view. But there is another tactic you can use too if you prefer. You can just take the starting note of any chord, stack a minor third on top, which is that one and a half steps, one and a half, and then from that note, you can stack two whole steps, one, two, and that gives you the whole chord. That works from any note as well. This is the opposite way round to the major chord formula, which was two whole steps followed by one and a half whole steps. I find this way can sometimes make people look at the chord a bit too zoomed in and think step by step too much, and then they lose track and lose sight of the notes that come afterwards. That also makes them put their hands down bit by bit instead of coming straight down in one. I think the other one is actually more effective and simpler in the long run when it comes to learning more chords in the future. It's really beneficial as well. But whatever clicks with you the most is best. So my favorite method for memorizing these well and finding them quickly and easily actually involves knowing the major chords first. If you don't know all the major chords yet, that's fine. I've got some other tips coming up too, but I do recommend checking out my major chords video linked in the description. So once you know all the 12 major chords fluently without having to think about building them, you can literally just move the third down a half step. We're in root position, so the third would be the middle note. So if you know F major, just move the middle one down a half step, and you get F minor too. You know E flat major, middle note down a half step, E flat minor, same with all of them, B, down a half step, B minor. You can do this kind of thing when you play chords in other ways too, but for now just focus on the root position where it's the middle note that you move. The great thing about this method is that you can apply it to new chord types that you learn, maybe adjusting a different note in the chord, or adding one on, or perhaps both. Once you can see these frameworks quickly, it becomes clearer and quicker over time to keep learning more. You don't have to start new chords from scratch each time, you just adjust something that you're already comfortable with, and each time you do that, you get 12 new chords for every small adjustment that you learn. I think for me, seeing all those different kinds of shapes, especially when you get to more complicated chords, used to be a real challenge, but using that kind of method is when things really started to click for me and I could see stuff appear on the keyboard much more easily. A useful practice trick is to divide these 12 chords into four groups. Let's use the same four groups as I did in the major video for consistency. This helps dividing your memorization into more manageable chunks. You could go through each group individually, focus on one group per session. So you could take C, F and G minor first. Go up and down those. Then do D flat, E flat, A flat. Then you could mix two groups together and then three and then all of them. Remember to spend a bit of time on each hand as well so both get used to molding into those different kinds of shapes comfortably. You can also practice these chords, again like the majors, by going up in half steps, C minor, C sharp minor, D minor, E flat minor, and so on. You could go up and down all 12, or if that's too hard to start with, you could go up two chords, and then three, and then four, see how far you can get. One day you could do three from C, so C, C sharp, and D minor. The next day, do D sharp, E, and F minor, and then the next three, and then the next three, or you could divide it up into three groups of four. Try different approaches and see what you can manage and see what works best for you. You could do it to a metronome or a backing track to make things more interesting. Gradually try and do it faster. You could even add a bit of rhythm if you like to make it more fun. And you can also go around the circle of fifths or the circle of fourths to make sure you hit every key. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It is a little bit harder because you have to follow a pattern, but it's there if you want to use it. Finally, you want to test yourself on finding random chords. If you have someone to help you, that's even better. They can pick a random chord name for you, or you could just think of one or find one out of a hat, and then you have to find it on the piano as quick as you can. Then check if it's correct, and you can use my worksheet for that, or just Google it. You should also practice this the other way around to get good at recognizing shapes that you see in parts of music. This is a little bit harder to do on your own unless you make flashcards or something of the pictures of the chords. But if you have someone to help, they could play the chord on the piano for you, and then you have to name it as quick as you can. Doing it both ways helps mimic a wider range of practical applications learning music. 
Like I said, it's well worth spending a bit of time on getting these confident and also make sure to look out for these shapes appearing in music that you're learning too. Because understanding and seeing how these kinds of things are actually used helps you learn and memorize things far more quickly. You're seeing chunks of information and recognizing underlying structures which makes everything far more manageable to memorize. Don't forget there's the worksheet linked in the description, the theory video too, and the major chord one if you've not seen that yet. Let me know in the comments if this video is helpful and please give it a like if it was because those things really help the channel start to grow. Subscribe for more content to help you develop your piano playing. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.